Hi everyone, my name is Anton Pelcher. I'm an engineer and I've been building fish farms for over 10 years. In this video, we're going to talk about such an important thing as water oxygenation at rice farms. We will learn if fish needs oxygen at all. Well, I'm joking, surely it does. We will also talk about what types of oxygen saturating equipment exist and what options for saturating water with pure oxygen as well as with oxygen from the atmospheric air you can use at your farm. Be sure to watch this video to the end, because you will learn not only what devices and oxygenation units options exist, but also the basic principles of calculating parameters of oxygenation units at your rest farm. Well, it's probably obvious that fish needs oxygen to breathe. Fish breathes with the help of gills. They intake oxygen from the water. So, water needs to be oxygenated somehow. Firstly, how is it done? Secondly, how much oxygen should be contained in the water? And let's start with just how much oxygen fish needs in principle. There exist two basic calculation methods, and the first one is based on the amount of feed. So, conventionally, we have fed one kilogram of feed to the fish, and the fish has consumed a certain amount of oxygen. Usually, rest designers take the figure between 300-500 grams, meaning that for one kilogram of feed, 300-500 grams of oxygen is consumed by the fish. We have 12 tanks. Each tank contains 3,000 fingerlings with a weight of 7 grams. We multiply 7 grams and get about 250 kilograms of fish. Then we take this figure, the average feeding rate of 5% per day, as it's a 7 grams fry, and we get 12.5 kilograms of feed per day. And now we take the sacred figure 0.3, that is 300 grams per kilogram of oxygen per hour. And for the grower fish, we usually use slightly higher coefficient closer to 0.5. We get 3.75 kilograms of oxygen per day, divided by 24 hours, and we ultimately get almost 160 grams of oxygen per hour. Let's memorize that figure. Now let's calculate by the second method. The second calculation method implies that there is such a thing as specific oxygen consumption. Thus, the final figure is calculated based not on the amount of feed, but on the biomass of fish, and generally taken into consideration what type of fish that is and what its weight is. We have fry in the tanks, so its specific oxygen consumption is maximal, about 500 mg of oxygen per kilogram of fish per hour. That is, we take 250 kg of fish, multiply by 0.5 grams, and we get 125 grams of oxygen per hour is consumed by the fry. You might ask me what method I usually prefer to make calculations. I usually use both methods. First, I calculate basin on the first method, then using the other method, then the figure which is higher is taken as basis, because otherwise you can calculate a little bit wrong and not provide for enough oxygen in the system. What for? It's always better to slightly oversaturate water with oxygen than undersaturate it. Now let's talk to you about how oxygen gets into the water. There are three options for oxygenating water. The first is natural oxygenation. Water gets oxygen naturally in any open water body. So let's imagine that we have an open lake, a pond. There is a conventional boundary between water and oxygen. This is just the contact area. And oxygen diffuses with water molecules. In this way, the water gains oxygen. And this oxygen can be consumed by the fish and used for its breathing. Which in fact, it usually does in ponds and lakes and all natural water bodies, in general, where fish stock intensity is not very high. This option is good. Oxygen is absolutely free, but it can be used as long as you have a minimum stock intensity in your ponds, lakes, or any open water bodies. The second option of oxygenating water involves aerating it with air, artificial saturating water with oxygen, but still using atmospheric air. In this case, there are some options. Firstly, how is it done? Well, for example, an aerator is put on the pond, if we are talking about open systems. A water cascades down somewhere, breaks into droplets, the contact area of oxygen and water is maximized, and water is saturated with oxygen due to accelerated diffusion. Well, and of course, aerating water in the tanks with air can be also attributed to this option. When diffusers are placed at the bottom, air is supplied from blowers, and accordingly, the water is saturated with oxygen. Well, and the third option is saturating water with pure oxygen. What is the difference? The difference is that pure oxygen saturation allows to saturate water much more than in case of saturating with atmospheric air. When you saturate water with atmospheric air, there is a certain limit, called 100% saturation, and it cannot take in more oxygen, and you can do nothing about it. Therefore, pure oxygen saturation is used at intensive and super-intensive farms. When oxygen contains 93-95% O2, the rest will certainly be other gases, such as nitrogen. A special mixing device is provided for, saturating water with oxygen to a limit which is above 100%. 
so that much more fish can be kept in the same volume of water with the same water exchange. This is the main option, which is used in general at all intensive type fish farms. How do we measure the level of oxygen? Well, we clearly understand that oxygen dissolved in water. The fish consumes it. That's all great. But how do we even know how much oxygen we have and whether we should increase its level or not? There are some fairly simple measurements for that. There is a simple device called a thermooximeter, which measures the level of oxygen dissolved in the water. Right now you can see that you just dip the electrode into the water and it displays the oxygen level index on the monitor. Now let's figure out how do we, in principle, supply oxygen to water. Oxygen level, and I have already mentioned 100% saturation, is very much dependent on temperature. The lower water temperature is, the higher the oxygen level at 100% saturation is. So, usually in cold water systems, even those without forced oxygen saturation, oxygen level is higher and the fish can breathe much easier than in warm water systems. Conversely, 100% saturation is minimal. Does it can drop as low as 7 mg per liter and go up to 13 mg per liter on average? Of course, this also depends on the altitude, if you go into details concerning the sea level. Accordingly, let's now talk about how we oxygenate water at all. Let's start with aeration by air. So, we're talking about supplying water with oxygen through normal aeration. And option one is a simple unit providing for the water falling down. You've probably seen it some outdated fish farms, where they specially made such perforated tubes with holes, so-called flirts, and fed the water to the fish holding tanks, so that water jets out of this tube, falls down, collides with the water, which is already in the tanks, is broken into droplets and mixes. What were they doing? They maximally increase the area of water oxygen contact so that extra gases, such as nitrogen, were released into the atmosphere and water was saturated with oxygen. This is the simplest oxygen saturation method. Making use of such a device, it's possible to maintain stocking density of 10-15 kg per cubic meter. But in fact, no more than that. Of course, I can give you more accurate calculations, but I think that I will do that in a separate video because otherwise we will get deeply into details and spend an extra hour. But nevertheless, it's important to understand that this device gives minimum 100% saturation. Then fish quickly consumes this oxygen, if it's an intensive system. And that's it, there is no more oxygen in the water. Then you either need to increase the water exchange or use some other devices and units. The next option, a little more advanced in terms of technology, is aeration directly inside the tanks. There's you put aerators, and there are different diffusers. There are tubular, there are disc ones, actually lots of variants. It's like in an aquarium, and I'm sure that some of you used to have one, maybe some have it now. You feed air from compressors to these diffusers, and they constantly saturate the tank with atmospheric air. In principle, this is already better. Here you can keep up to 35 kg per cube. This fish stock intensity is average, of course. But it's important to understand that you will automatically get a high power consumption to make blows operate, because really a lot of oxygen is required. In this case, it's atmospheric air. You can use such an aeration system, but to tell you frankly, at intensive type farms, it's rarely used. If we take into consideration an industrial scale rest farm, if you want to keep 50, 70, 80, maybe even 100 kilograms of fish per cubic meter. Of course, this method of water saturation with oxygen will simply not give the desired result, and you will either have to spend a huge amount of money on electricity, or to opt for a more efficient oxygen saturation unit. And let's consider such more efficient units more closely, because we're going over to oxygen generators, the units which saturate water with pure oxygen. I will now tell you about their types, how these units are selected, and how they are used in general. Let's start probably not even with the oxygen generator. Let's better start with where to get pure oxygen from. And there are several options. First of all, pure oxygen can be taken from special tanks with liquefied oxygen. In fact, you buy a special tank and fill it with liquefied oxygen and gradually diffuse it. That is, the oxygen from the tank evaporates and gets to the oxygenator. And then it's dissolved. So, what are the advantages of this unit? First of all, you don't need electric power to produce oxygen, and also a storage tank with liquefied oxygen will probably be cheaper than a generator. But it's important to understand that liquefied oxygen certainly has its disadvantages. You have to constantly refill these tanks. That is, you will need some kind of external contractor, 
who will constantly supply you with oxygen and refill your tanks. I'm not talking now about oxygen bottles or cylinders, if they are generally such an option, which is suitable either to provide backup oxygen used in emergency cases or at very small farms. So, liquefied oxygen is an alternative to oxygen from the cylinders, but it costs money, and it's important to understand that during the pandemic years of 2020th and 2021st, there were price leaps, so there are some significant risks if you use liquefied oxygen. And the next option for obtaining oxygen is using oxygen generators and concentrators. What is actually the difference between them? In fact, the process is the same. You have adsorption tanks filled with zeolite. You feed air to these tanks. So what is contained in the air from the atmosphere? 80% of various gases and 20% of oxygen. And these tanks with zeolite separate all gases, which basically consist of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and so on. They separate them and discharge into the atmosphere. And then they transform 20% of oxygen into 100%, because all other gases are already out. And pure oxygen gets into a storage tank or directly into an oxygen generator, for example. So, concentrators and generators differ only in the fact that concentrators are usually small, they have low pressure at the outlet, while generators are large industrial machines. Units, they have higher pressure at the outlet. Of course, they are more reliable and more expensive. So, if you have a choice between concentrators and generators, usually concentrators are used at small farms and generators at large ones because concentrators are very much limited in capacity. Naturally, they are less reliable, they have lower pressure at the outlet, although with a certain approach it's not needed, and they are, so to say, less durable than oxygen generators. But they cost 5-10 times less than an industrial oxygen station. So, I'm a proponent of both. But if you have a small farm, why would you buy an expensive Mercedes? Meaning, why would you buy a generator when you can buy a simple oxygen concentrator and get pure oxygen exactly the same that is produced by the oxygen station? Basically, the whole oxygen saturation process is based on two principles. I won't go into detail now, because I'll probably do it in a separate video. The first is the contact area of oxygen with water, which means that the more contact area you have, the more efficiently the oxygen penetrates into the water. And the second is the pressure. The higher the pressure you create inside the oxygen saturation unit, the more oxygen gets into the water. Thus, all oxygenators, all saturation units operate on these two principles. And some farmers make use of of only one principle, some use the other, and the rest try to combine both. This is actually the difference between oxygenation units. Well, let's start with the most frequently used one, the oxygen cone. Probably many people who have been interested in this topic have heard what an oxygen cone is. It's a cone-shaped unit, which is a cylindrical bottom. Water is fed from above, and also oxygen is fed to it. And by creating high pressure inside this cone, water and oxygen mix, and the water gets saturated with oxygen. That is, the cone inside is empty, and the water gets saturated with oxygen only due to the pressure. This unit is good, reliable. Its advantages are that it's simple, it operates perfectly, there are no problems and failures. But its disadvantage is just the pressure, because to create this pressure, you need a high pressure pump, and it costs much and consumes much electricity. Therefore, oxygen cones is a good option, and it's actually used all over the world. But there is a nuance that it's quite costly in terms of energy consumption. It doesn't consume electricity itself, but the pump creating pressure inside the cone does. So, in principle, it's a good option, but keep in mind that it has such disadvantages. And I forgot to mention that these oxygen cones are made of different materials, for example, stainless steel, which is in principle the most reliable option, fiberglass, which is also fine. Some make them from polypropylene or plastic, and these are usually amateur-made ones. In general, the most important things are that they don't lose shape and to maintain pressure that is created inside this cone. By the way, the main disadvantage of plastic is that it holds pressure very poorly, unlike fiberglass and stainless steel. Now I'm standing close to the typical, most common oxygenator option used at RAS farms – an oxygen cone. Let's figure out how this cone operates. Basically, it's a tank, closed pressure tank, which is made of stainless steel. From the top of this cone, water flows into the cone, and the oxygen is fed to it as well. 
that's how the oxygen and water mix. It's actually empty inside. There is nothing there. But the tricky thing is how to fed the water right, how to fed the oxygen correctly, and at what pressure. The pumps create a certain pressure, not less than 0.5 bar. Although the more oxygen you need to dissolve in this cone, the more pressure you have to create in it. Oxygen is fed into this particular cone from the oxygen station. It's supplied to the top point of the unit. Water is pumped up the cone through a special pipeline, and then water and oxygen are mixed there. This mixture then falls towards the oxygen cushion. If this cone is now partly filled with water and partly with oxygen. In order for an efficient mixing process to take place, both oxygen and water must be fed to the cone, so that they have a contact area and the pressure should be created by the pumps. How much pressure is needed? The minimum pressure is 0.5 bar, as it's a pressure oxygenator. But the ideal pressure for such equipment in order to dissolve enough oxygen is 1 bar. In principle, fish doesn't consume much oxygen now, so the pressure of 0.5 bar, even less, is sufficient at the moment. So, how can you determine how much oxygen is inside the cone now? It's very simple. This is the sighting tube, and the water level is the actual water level inside the oxygen cone. So, now the oxygen water border is roughly in the middle, which as principle is pretty good for operating such a unit. Well, and the second option is low-pressure oxygenator. What are low-pressure oxygenators? By and large, they're combining a not very high pressure to avoid electric power excessive consumption and at the same time maximize the oxygen water contact area. So you create pressure. And if in oxygen cones you have to create the pressure of 1, 1.5 bars, which is relatively high, then in these low-pressure units, the pressure of 0.5 bar is usually sufficient for water to get saturated with oxygen to the same level of 20-25 mg per liter. Accordingly, how does the system work? There are jets variations, for example. What are jets? You have a cylinder. Inside this cylinder, there is a special plate with nozzles. Water is supplied under pressure to these nozzles from above. Pours out of nozzles in jets downwards. Falls to the oxygen cushion. Mixes with oxygen effectively. And thus, comes out already saturated with oxygen. Thus, by forcing oxygen and water inside and capturing oxygen by water jets, the maximum possible oxygen water contact area is created inside this unit. And accordingly, water is saturated with oxygen in the same way as in cones, but at lower pressure. Yes, there are other variations of low-pressure oxygenators. If there are some other variations, don't hesitate to write me in the comments to this video, because I surely came across some other variations, but I didn't consider them in details. So, if you have your own opinion, if you know some other technologies, share it in the comments. Well, and the third option of oxygen generators is non-pressure oxygenators. What is the principle of their operation? You just need to feed the water at a relatively small height, lift it upward so that it drops down or something similar in order that water gets saturated with oxygen. These are precisely non-pressure oxygen generators that operate exactly on the principle of oxygen-water contact area. What is a classic, standard, non-pressure oxygen generator? This is a cube with a perforated plate on the top. Water is fed into it, falls down inside special chambers. That is, the oxygenator is divided into chambers. Oxygen passes through these chambers, from one chamber to another, and comes out at the end. Passing through five, seven, eight chambers, oxygen comes in maximum contact with those falling streams of water, and water, saturated to 15, maximum 18 mg per liter, flows out of this unit. So, this is an option that can be used if you want to save on electricity. What are the advantages of non-pressure oxygenators? Practically no pressure is required. The whole process is based on water falling down. You practically don't need any pressure. You can use propeller pumps, rather low-pressure pumps, and save on electricity costs. Thus, this oxygen generator has significant advantages, but there are disadvantages as well. The major one is that the maximum oxygen saturation of water in this oxygen generator is 15-18 mg per liter, and this is often not enough for the systems with high stocking densities. So, it's going to require a more intensive water exchange. It means that you kind of save an energy as you can use a lower pressure pump. But at the same time, you have to provide for a more intensive water exchange, and thus you spend more on energy due to this fact. 
Therefore, use the non-pressure oxygenator wisely, otherwise you will save money in some way and lose money in another. But still, that's not all. There are other types of oxygen generators which I will now tell you about. And one of them is of interest too. It's a mine oxygen generator. By the way, there are some Western companies that use mine oxygenators for their projects. What is it like? This is something like a borehole. Inside this borehole, there are two pipes, one external and one internal, respectively. Water enters either the external or the internal pipe falls down first, and then goes upwards, which means that we have a kind of non-pressure unit. But water, moving down the borehole for 10, 15, sometimes even 20 meters, finally gets the point at which the maximum pressure of the water column is created, that is 1.52 bars, and just at that point the oxygen is fed at high pressure, and I have already mentioned before that pressure helps oxygen to dissolve. It just dissolves in water without any oxygen-water contact area at all, because this area is minimal. The advantages of this unit are that it's practically non-pressure, so you feed water at one place, it just overflows to the other, so it operates on the principle of a displacer. But certainly it has disadvantages, otherwise everyone would use this unit. First of all, it is very expensive, because it's not a small expense to provide for such a mine oxygen generator. Well, and secondly, this process is complicated due to the groundwater. It will most likely be complicated to drill a well for 15-20 meters. Well, and of course, in northern units, either the oxygen dissolving efficiency of such a unit is low in terms of not oxygenating the water. I mean, not how many milligrams per liter you get at the outlet of the oxygen generator, but how much oxygen is simply lost to the atmosphere. So you have to put a recuperator when using such an oxygenator. Well, and the last option is a hybrid of a mine oxygenator and a jet. What is the principle of this unit operation? By and large, it's a tank that's a deeper than any standard oxygenator, but smaller in size. It's a rectangular tank that is usually 5 meters deep. A special plate with nozzles is placed inside the tank at a depth of 3-4 meters. Water is fed from above. That is, a column of water presses this plate. Then water emerges out in jets and comes in contact with an oxygen pillow and dissolves oxygen in it. It somehow combines pressure and contact area principles. Thus, this unit can also be classified as a low-pressure oxygenator. Basically, I have listed the major options of oxygenation units that can be used. If you have any other interesting alternatives, be sure to write about them in the comments. This is Anton Pelcher. Give me a like and subscribe to my channel the channel about how to farm fish and make good money.